معاك انا هلا 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 هات Sorry, Marcus, hey, can you hear me now? I ha I can, yes. Great, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Um, I'm on my way, a bit of traffic. Everything's okay. That's all right, no problem. Um, where was that? Oh, shit. Where was it? Uh... Okay, 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 how are we doing? Ben's coming in, Alan's coming in, Suzanne is coming in, and Todd. Uh, Suzanne, I'm going to make you a host. I am here. Hi, Todd. Sorry about oh, that. That's all good. Okay. So, Suzanne, if you could let other participants in uh, as we go, I'd be very grateful. I've just made you co-host. So... Um, welcome, one and all, to the Seller Code. Um, we are really pleased today to have Todd Capone on as our guest. Um, he's the author of The Transparency Sale. Um, he's had a huge influence on very many people within sales um, and leadership and management, particularly within the tech space. And he's a proper sales nerd. Um, he won't be offended by that. Um, we both are. Um, only he's got an archive that goes back to the 17th century. Um, and uh, I'm really good at stealing great ideas from him. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, Todd, could you just give us a couple of minutes on your background and then we'll get stuck into why we're having this conversation today? Man, you already nailed it. I, uh, yeah, my nerdery knows no bounds. Um, yeah, it was a call myself a B, B plus sales rep, but I always knew that, you know, leading and coaching and all of that was really what inspired me. And so I finally got tapped to be an SVP of sales back in 2008, did things that were a bit counterintuitive, but we grew that company, sold it to SAP. I was on the sales leadership team of Exact Target. We grew that, IPO'd and sold it to Salesforce for about 3 billion back in 2013. Went and did it again at Right Hemisphere, or I'm sorry, at uh, Power Reviews, built that up into Chicago's fastest growing tech company. And then like a lunatic, I quit my job, wrote a couple of books. And now when cool people are doing cool things on the weekends, I'm reading late 1800s, early 1900s books on sales and sales management. So that then brings us to the million dollar question. Um, what are the evergreen skills that just never go out of fashion, always work, whatever the economy, and throughout history have consistently demonstrated um, that they are reliable, um, they're stalwart. They, I mean, they just work without fail, without exception. Let's start with that. All right. Well, let's do two quotes. All right. So we'll, we'll start with uh, Dr. Frank Crane in 1918. from his commandments of salesmanship, he's got a quote that says, so this is number one, be a human being. Otherwise, your company would have sent a catalog. 
right? It's such a great quote, but it's, you know, be a human being. Otherwise, your company would have sent the catalog. All right. So that's always worked. And then number two is from 1911. And it's from Arthur Sheldon in his book, The Art of Selling, which I just got. Uh, it's over there. I, I was able to find it on eBay. My wife's going to kill me for how much I spent on it. But 1911, Arthur Sheldon, his quote is this. And this is number two. True salesmanship is the science of service. Grasp that thought firmly and never let go. So it might sound cheesy, but being a human being and having a service mindset was the foundation of the modern selling profession. It has worked over and over again. And when we have lost that grasp, like Arthur Sheldon said, that's when our profession has dropped to the bottom and has had a hard time getting back out of it. Hence the reason why we've pulled together the seller code. Yes. Um, I'm going to give everyone an opportunity simply to read through it and let it sink in. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to imagine you are a buyer and think about the kind of seller you would want to have the other side of the desk or the other side of the video to sell to you. And the seller code isn't rocket science. You know, being biocentric acting with genuine integrity, appreciating their perspective. I mean, who knew? Seeking to understand. These seem to be remarkably humane qualities, focusing on their outcomes. What, what's that about service? Um, being sincere. Maybe I should be slightly less glib in the delivery of that particular line. Um, eliminating, not reducing. I think we should change this. Eliminating their risk wherever possible. Wherever the, um, a buyer's brain perceives risk, it sees uncertainty, and uncertainty leads to the worst-case scenario running through their head. Matt Dixon, in The Jolt Effect, documents this. 60% of all pipeline ends up in the limbo of the status quo. Close loss, no decision. 52%, i.e. 31% of all the leads that you paid for, you put into the top of the funnel, you invested time, effort, money, resource, and opportunity cost, you blew because your salespeople misread a moment because they weren't really very good at eliminating the buyer's risk because they talked their way out of the sale instead of listening their way into it at that moment. Empower, empowering buyers with advocacy, being somebody who actually helps the buyer understand what's possible within their grasp, within their reach, and helps them move towards making a, a good decision well. Are we offering fair terms? Is the return going to be suitable? Over what time period? Is it the magnitude that they need? Will the other benefits benefit them more than just cash? Are we ensuring that once we've sold, we don't sell and run and do the drive-by shooting? Are we representing our employer as our shareholders would want us to represent them, our board, our leaders, and more importantly, as we would want to be remembered? And are we constantly learning and developing? Well, I've got to ask you, if you are the uh, the buyer and a seller turned up who ticked all of those boxes would you feel safe todd i let's let's debate a couple of these because yeah. i think they're they're fantastic and we can talk about the history of this concept by the way but let's talk about that eliminate risk thing i don't agree with that and here's why i believe that our role is to expose the pros and the cons Mm -hmm. the risks and the rewards, because we as human beings don't buy when we're convinced. We buy when we can predict. That's a, that, that's a big one, right? Mm -hmm. That if we buy when we're convinced, we're probably pissed about it 20 minutes later. Mm -hmm. We are prediction machines. There's a reason why we all read reviews, but most importantly, why we all read the negative reviews first. We have to get to that negative because we're trying to assess, hey, what could go wrong? What in what circumstances is this not going to be a fit? Mm -hmm. And so all of us, every product or solution that we sell has some level of risk, right? Because no solution has ever come out 
that doesn't get screwed up for somebody. My belief is our role is not to just reduce the risk where we can, but where we can't, we illuminate it transparently. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, and I'm in violent agreement with everything that you said. Um, my uh, view on removing their risk is removing any risk associated with me. My, be my belief, and uh, I've yet to find anyone who can prove me wrong, um, is human beings' brains are dopamine things. So they're a bit like, um, uh, what's his name, Al Pacino in Scarface, you know, die, mom. Um, you know, and it's going after dopamine. What I don't want to do is feed it with cortisol and adrenaline. So it's very binary. Yep. Don't feed it bad hormones, feed it good hormones. Um, so it's about whether they perceive a risk associated with me. Daryl Stickle's formula is uncertainty times vulnerability equals perceived risk. And this is what triggers anticipated buyer's remorse in the buyer's mind because they see me as a threat or they see my company or my proposition as not being certain to get them the outcome they intend. Yes. Yes, I, I would agree with that. So but the way that I look at it is, um, you know, for example, my wife and I are old souls. Um, when we go out to dinner, we're not going Saturday night at seven o'clock. We're going Wednesday at five. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we will read the <laughs> reviews. And what we're looking for is context. We're trying to make a prediction that, hey, I'm reading the reviews and all the negative ones are about how bad the service was when it was super busy and it was hard to get a table and all of that. I, all right, that's interesting, but I'm going Wednesday at five. How's the food, right? Like that's that's the context <laughs> that we're all looking at is there certain circumstances where your products and solutions are not a good fit. Illuminate those, illuminate the risk. Well, I, I think you've touched on something else, which is really important, which is get to what matters most for the customer. Exactly. Not yep. what you care about, but what they care about. Be human. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's right. I, I just, I had a company, a giant company reach out to me and they're like, hey, uh, Todd, we are evaluating sales methodology providers. <laughs> and I went through it. And, yeah. uh, and then as soon as she got done, I was like, all right, cool. Like, let's talk a little bit more about that because I don't provide a sales methodology, right? Like, let's talk about what I teach is applied philosophy, not methodology. And they're like, oh, all right. And all of a sudden I'm not trying to sell them. I'm a partner. We're trying to achieve mutual outcomes, whether it's with me or with somebody else as quickly as possible. There, there are six rules that I've started to realize um, that will govern whether we should or should not do say, type or act in any uh, circumstance? Is it timely? Is it relevant? And is it valuable to the individual to whom we are inflicting it or targeting it? Yep. Does it help them get clarity on the reality of their current situation? Does it help them understand what is possible and within their reach? Because if, if they don't think they can do it, it's not going any further. And does it help them advance towards making the right decision well yes. and not make the wrong decision and to eliminate the perception that if things were to go wrong, they would be in the soup. What they really want is to know that you have their back by a safe. Exactly. If you yeah, can you know, meet all six of those conditions, do it. If you can't meet any of those six conditions, don't. Fair? Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's funny that when I see, you know, I think yeah, you posted yesterday, like we're going to talk about ethical selling and all of that. And there's there's people that view that as like, yeah, yeah, I want to be ethical. Like that would be that would be good, right? As it turns out, ethical selling sells better, mm. right? Like what what you laid out sells better than trying to do something else. Ethical selling isn't just oh that's sweet, Marcus. Thank you. It's it actually helps you not only sell faster, but have customers who stay, buy more, they advocate for you. We got to remember that 2024, here, a little rant for you. And you know, I'm, I get fired up. I got plenty of coffee here, but um, <laughs> you know, you keep seeing, like, I always see this stuff about like how the whole world of selling has changed and it's all different than it. No, no, it's not. No. The, the creed, the thing that you just laid out 
I've got here from 1905. I've got this one from 1906 or 1926. This is for the tractor industry. I've got this one. Uh, I don't remember. Oh, this is uh, 1914, another creed. This one's 1905. This one's 1905, right? Like this has all been laid out. The things that you wrote are almost exactly the same thing as we've seen over and over and over again, because A, we know it works. B, that customers require this because sales can be a necessary evil, but it survive, it survives and thrives when it is adding value to the buying journey and helping customers do the homework. I will tell you though, there are two things that have changed in selling that we need to be aware of. Number one, 2024, we are in an as a service or subscription economy now. Back when I started selling, you would sell the deal we were selling, like in technology, we were selling, I sold for SAP, sold massive perpetual licenses, and then they would pay maintenance. And what did I give a crap about maintenance? I wasn't getting paid on it anyway. The deal was the peak. Now it's merely an early milestone mm -hmm. on the path to having customers who buy, stay, buy more and advocate. So we've got to play the long game. We have to. Number two is the proliferation of information, reviews, feedback that's available on everything we buy everything we do, everything we experience means we have to be honest. We have to tell the truth. The, there's a, a quote that I just read from Arthur Sheldon in 1909 that I love. And it's just basically this idea that, hey, there's more to business building than in business getting, right? There's more to business building than in business getting. We've got to play the long game because it helps you win the long game. But in this economy, in this change that we're in, it helps you win the short game too, because that one deal you're going to win that maybe you shouldn't is probably going to cost you four deals that you didn't even know existed because the ability for customers to share their bad experiences both online and with their peers in the dark circles of LinkedIn and their networks, we've got to play the long game, sell honestly and lead with what you give up to be great at your core. So to build on Todd's point, Stop fixating on the short-term pipeline. Yes. The short-term pipeline is, if, if you're focusing on the short-term pipeline, you're trying to export the fact that you failed to do your job six to 36 months before, and you're now trying to pile the pressure onto your customer and convince them, make them buy when they're not ready, when they shouldn't. Now, you can... Win new business three ways. You can go out and win, win a greenfield new business. You can expand or you can recapture, recover old accounts. Now, what is interesting is cold has around a one to 3% conversion rate. And in fact, I'm talking to companies now where they have to have 10,000 leads that they buy from Zoom Info at the top to get one paying customer at the bottom. That is 0 0.01 or 0.01 percent. That feels to me as someone who is coming to the uh, tail end of my life, like a monumental waste of the one thing I can never get back again and a criminal. I mean, the idea that a leader would ask me to sacrifice my time to do something that only incurs cost, admin, opportunity cost and loss, and failed to generate the outcome that we intended, which is new customers who stay with us for a long time, make a profit and bring their wealthy friends, it does seem counterproductive. Warm referrals convert one in six, that's 16.7%. Winbacks actually convert somewhere between 20% and 40%. Now, if you compare that with cold, you're talking somewhere between an 11 and 40 X improvement in the outcome. Why we go to work. The reason we're there. Now, if you get hot, typically it's 64 to 81%. And if you've got an ecosystem, you could very comfortably be closing around 95 to hundred percent, which means you need a minuscule pipeline. So just to wrap this point up, you have four types of seller. You win, I win. 
that's what Todd and I have been talking about all day today. You have the I win, you win. And these are the ones who are the top performers. They're probably the 16% below the top 4% and above the middle 60% layer of mush that is average. Then you have the I win, don't really care what happens to you as long as I don't lose brigade. And let's face it, that's most people. And then I win, you lose. And they're the ones that drag us all right down to the bottom feeders. And I think we've got to come back to the fact that in 1905, forecast accuracy was typically what, Todd? It was a lot better than it is now. It was certainly not something they talked about in any of these books or magazines. Forecast when accuracy first was appear? not a problem. Was when that? did it first appear? Um, 1898 was when the first understanding of the buying journey and forecasting methodology appeared. And, and it become a problem in the in the literature. It, it's, I mean, I'm starting to see the beginnings of it in really the 1960s and 1970s. And you know, where I put my finger on that is a, another little rant for everybody. But that 1898 version that was Elias St. Elmo Lewis, 1898. What he did was he defined the journey that all buyers go on on their journey to make a purchase, right? And it's the one thing that Blake from Mitch and Murray and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross got right on his whiteboard <laughs> or his chalkboard was AIDA. He actually got one word wrong in it though, but AIDA. So Elias St. Elmo said that all buyers, first, are they paying attention, right? Do we have their attention? Then have, they, like, have we developed an interest within them in what we're talking about? And then the D is desire. Have we generated a desire within them for this solution? And then the last day is action. Are they ready to take action? That became the foundational process for all sales processes and for forecasting philosophies through at least the 1920s. You know, Arthur Sheldon, Norval Hawkins, uh, every book that you see, a lot, um, Elmer Ellsworth Lewis in 1924 wrote, hey, we all know it's AIDA. Any business and sales philosopher worth their salt knows, we're not going to talk about it. It's AIDA. Here's a chart. Go read another book if you want to learn about it, right? Like, now, what is AIDA and what's the problem? AIDA was about recognizing buyer behavior and basing your selling activities based on what a buyer is saying and doing in their words and actions and forecasting based on where the buyer is, right? That was our lens, our endorphins that we got going through the, the process were based on the buyer's progress through the journey, not what became in the CRM world, especially, you know, hubs, or, um, Siebel and then Salesforce and HubSpot out of the, like, think about it. Your forecasting stages in your CRM, what are they? Oh, they're all based on what sellers are doing, right? Like prospect and then qualify and discover and demo and propose and negotiate. No wonder we can't forecast. No wonder we've lost our connection to the buyers and their outcomes. Our endorphins and all of our measures are based on what sellers are doing. AIDA was about recognizing buyer behavior, the foundation for all of it for 50 years. And no wonder the perception of sales was higher then, forecasting accuracy was higher. And again, our connection to our buyers was better. We, we've got to get back. And now I'm not saying AIDA is necessarily the answer, but you know the, the modern version is kind of the why change. So what is a customer doing and acting that tells me that they recognize that their status quo is worth changing. And then why you versus all of the ways that I can invest my time, my resources, my money, why you versus another solution. And then they go to why now, right? Should I do this now? Or is this something that can be deprioritized while I take care of other things? You can layer why change, why you, why now over your existing CRM stages. And I'm telling you, you're, Team will become more attuned to the customers. Your forecast will be more accurate too. We did this at Power Reviews. My 90 day forecast was within three and a half percent for six quarters in a row. Now, part of that's luck, uh, but again, being customer focused and 
basically predicting when a customer will buy based on what they're doing, not what we're doing. It's magic and it's super freaking easy. And it really boils down to something very simple. You can either enlist your brain and your buyer's brain at an unconscious level to become allies, or you can create a sense of threat or risk in either one of you. And that rarely ends well for you as a seller. Yep. Because if you create a perception of risk, the brain's default setting to uncertainty is the worst case scenario. Yep. They turn into chicken little. They anticipate the worst case happening. They unconsciously associate you with the worst case scenario in that moment. And we institutionalize this in playbooks because we are driven to sell selfishly because every stage of our sales process is about us and not the customer. How do we get leadership to recognize that they are the architect of the reason why they have to overhire, over assign quota, and then fire people because of their stupidity? Well, dude, there's so many paths we can take. You just triggered about eight things. I'm like, I can talk about this. And I'm going on to mute. Over to you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I love it, dude. So uh, let's talk about leadership issue. You had mentioned earlier when you were going through conversion rates for new versus warm versus hot, like an and ecosystem type leads. You're right. Like the, the thing that jumped into my mind was it's like we got to stop blaming the salespeople. It really starts at leadership. I'll give you one example. One of the things I used to do wrong as a sales leader, I used to measure my reps' progress by pipeline load, meaning my reps at all times, hey, you got to have 4X your quota and pipeline, right? Like that was always the thing. Hey, wh why don't you have 4X? You got to have 4X. You're on, like, as a result, what did the reps do? They filled their pipeline to 4X, filled with crap, right? Like, because that's what we were driving them to do. We were looking at hey, it's a leading indicator. If you don't have enough pipeline, you're not going to close enough. So go fill it with crap. And so I'm not in your butt about it. Let's make sure that you've always got 4X. So what do the reps do? They lose slowly. They work opportunities they shouldn't be working. And to your point earlier, you know, there's a quote from, I don't remember what year, but it was, you know, a, a great salesperson hoards minutes as a miser hoards gold. Yeah. But- the leadership measures are inadvertently driving your reps to spend time on things they shouldn't be. So when you talked about, hey, you could have a minuscule pipeline, that's the goal, isn't it? Like, hey, we should be looking at why is it 4X? Why can't it be 2X? And if it is 4X, it means you're probably going to do 200% because we're working the right opportunities. And if you don't have the pipeline load, let's be transparent about it. Let's welcome it so that we can help you instead of the opposite, which is why aren't you at 4X, which drives so much inefficiency in organizations. Well, last year, around February, BlackRock, Tiger, and Y Combinator changed their minds about the business model that they wanted. And instead of collecting revenue at any cost, going after new logos and um, new revenue and market share, um, they suddenly decided that we had to collect money, actual cash, and make a profit. Um, now, everything that made the seller or the manager a hero in that old model now turns them into a villain. Um, you can't bring deals forward because um, if you bring a deal forward, you then create all that on cost in terms of uh, the tariff of workload it takes to fill a pipeline. And profitability is key. So focusing on cold new with an 18% profitability level and a 1% to 3% win rate compared with an 81% or 64% conversion rate with 1150% um, margin, I know where if, I were, if it was my money, I would want my people to be spending their time because that delivers 10,000 bucks an hour instead of 10 bucks an hour. Now, um, when we spend our time stepping back and reflecting, and we look at the ripple effect of a bad decision at the top, we look at something like 
throwing money at digital marketing to fill the top of the funnel. Because let's face it, when times is tough, what do we do? We throw more shit in at the top. Yeah. So a 3% click-through rate with a 15% conversion rate means that you successfully generated revenue 0.0045% of the time. You failed to generate revenue 99.9955%. Now, of the 85% that did not convert of the 3%, they get chucked over the fence to sales. Who on average for warm inbound have to follow up six to 11 times just to have one effective. The cold um, leads, they have to do 33 to 46 dials to get one effective. On average, it's 14 effectives to get one first meeting. And then on average, seven out of eight first meetings are blown so they don't get invited back. That begs the question, what do we have to do to stop that? And how do we get two out of eight, three out of eight, four out of eight to convert at the bottom of the funnel? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, at the beginning of that, you talked about, you know, this change, you know, BlackRock and the financial service, like caring about profitability and the, the word suddenly, um, you know, history has repeated itself exactly. And in February of 22, I wrote an article saying that get ready because all of the measures are going to start focusing on profitability again because we're repeating history, right? Yeah. Like but this time frame that we're in right now is exactly mirroring 1914 to 1923 to a T and it continues to, it looks exactly the same. We could see in February of 22, when inflation started going up, that it was mirroring late 1919, which was right before a fall and what I call the great salesperson purge of 1921 and 1922. 1921, there was 77% salesperson turnover. In 1922, it was 85%. And then, hey, survivability meant cash flow. We need to focus on profitability instead of revenue at all costs. Like, oh, that's that's really, that's amazing. Well, that's exactly what we're doing now, right? It's we're we're following history exactly. Now, my my hope is that we don't follow history exactly into 1929, 1930, 1931, but I okay. think we're probably protected against that, at least that extreme. Um, okay, I'm going to go there because I think we need to, because in Europe, Middle East, um, that may not be the case. I think America for the time being is buffered, um, but or North America is, but let's face it, 50% um, of the democracies on the planet have a general election this year, um, and so do you and we. Um, and yours is something of a pantomime. Um, so I wouldn't hold your breath. So let's go to 1929 to 1932. Um, what happened? Well, I'm still researching exactly what happened there um, from a sales perspective. I mean, we just we keep following the same flow. Yeah. Where we, you know, you had slow and steady growth from 1914 to 1917. And then you go into World War I, the economy shuts down. When we come out of it, the pendulum is pulled back, it swings. So we go really, really strong growth. And then suddenly it goes back and we get into a depression, the forgotten depression of the early 1920s. And then the pendulum kind of swings to the middle and we're like, hey, let's be smart for a little bit. But we had high growth for a couple of years there, right? It was the roaring 20s and the pendulum started to swing a little bit and we got over our skis again for a number of years to where all of a sudden it just pinched back up again. I'm trying to figure out exactly why or how that happened so that we can see the signs of it. I, I don't know if you've got a perspective on that. Uh, well, um, definitely. I mean, I, I'm with you. History repeats and those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat the same mistakes. And we're repeating them over and over again. Um, politically, um, we are seeing exactly the same patterns happening. Um, in 1939, uh, in Madison Square Gardens, there was a Nazi rally with full swastikas paid for largely by um, uh, the American Nazi Party and the uh, Nazis in Germany, uh, with 20,000 people there. In the 1930s, there was an attempted insurrection by the far right. Um, the this is about economics. It's not about politics. Um, again, this is bound to be uh, incendiary. But if we look at the Hamas situation, 
Okay, uh, you know, if there wasn't widespread uh, poverty for many, many years and a sense of voicelessness and so on, um, they probably wouldn't have done it. And um, because that's what happens throughout history, whether it's the English Civil War, um, and it's often the middle class that drives it, and um, because they think that they can control the dictators. Um, and it always backfires. So we're seeing this in uh, the same thing happening in leadership, because big money is spending a huge amount in order to try and sway the political system and the legal system and the tax system to give them greater advantage. And we're seeing a huge shift um, in wealth inequality. And the ultra rich have taken more in the last four years than ever. I think they've had a 7% increase in their wealth to the tune of something like in the US and the UK, $36 trillion. I mean, just to conceive of that num uh, volume of zeros, it's looking for a home. And when they get money, it goes straight into buying more assets and working. That's how the system works. And it's now skewed it to the point where it's sucking so much value out of the system that it feels like we're coming to that point again. The fourth turning talks about this. We've hit the peak of the millennial crisis, according to Howe. Um, if you uh, read Ray Dalio's uh, Making Sense of the Changing World Order, he's also talking about this. Um, uh, I can't, uh, uh, Peter Tushin, uh, he's also talking about this. So we're seeing these patterns all culminating over the next few years. Tell us what happens, what happened, um, and how best to prepare for it. Because we don't have any choice that the context is going to happen. How we respond to it, we do. Yeah. Man, I wish I had the answers to that one. But it, can I, uh, I'm going to, let's talk for a second about the second part of what you had talked about earlier around the role of marketing. Yeah. Um, because I've got a, a strong opinion there. Because um, you're right. Uh, every marketing organization that I've worked with that's worked for me, it's been about top of funnel. And it's, a, and you know, that, that reality, like you said, that every lead has a cost. Are we getting an ROI on all of that lead? And I, I just go back to thinking about the best B2C companies in the world. The best B2C companies in the world are really good at branding what they're good at and what they're not, right? Like Ikea. Ikea is a nightmare, but everybody that walks into it knows exactly what they're getting. They know that they're going to be handed a map because they're not going to be able to find anything. They know that they're going to have to find what they're looking for on their own. There's not going to be a salesperson helping you feng shui your living room. They know they're going to have to take a picture of the little card that shows them where in the warehouse they're going to go downstairs and go get the massive boxes and put it on the carts that don't have bricks. They know that they're going to have to roll it into the parking lot and F-bomb their way into jamming the boxes Tetris style into the back of their car. They know they're going to have to go home, lug the hundred you know, these massive boxes into their house, open it up and have 150 parts on the floor. And the only word on the work instructions is Svarta or whatever weird scan. Yorn. Right. <laughs> and they, they know they're going to F-bomb their way through the assembly and then they're going to go, hey, that wasn't that bad. We should go get the end tables with this bedroom set. Like that's stupid. But the point being that, you know, Ikea, the, the warehouse shopping clubs, you know, we've got Costco's, there's Sam's clubs. You know that you're going to get no brand selection. You got to pay to walk in. You're going to have to buy a freaking tank of ranch dressing. They're not going to give you a bag. They're going to give you a dirty box. There's going to be somebody at the door checking your receipt to make sure you didn't steal anything. And you're going to resubscribe again next year, right? The, the B2C companies that succeed, you know, Costco is the number two retailer here in the US behind Walmart. Ikea is the number one furniture retailer in the world for 14 straight years. That's, I think, the opportunity for marketing to instead of create this massive wide funnel, let's brand what we give up to be great at our core. What is our core? What are we great at? Under what circumstances are we a good choice? Under what circumstances are we not a good choice? Every lead that comes through, expectations are met. You become super efficient in your processes. And to your point, you need a minuscule pipeline that converts at a high percentage instead of this massive top of funnel that each one of those things has a little cost that spews out of the funnel on the way out. That, that's just my rant about the role <laughs> of marketing needs to be more about defining what you're good at, what you're not, 
and brand it. I, I think it goes deeper than that, though. I, th I think there needs to be alignment around the customer. Everything needs to be built from the customer out and back from there. Every single job in the business needs to have a window to the customer. They need to understand what impact they are having directly or indirectly on the customer's experience and the realization of the outcome they intended. And what outcomes they do not deliver and what risks and what things could go wrong. Absolutely. And this, again, is why transparency is so essential. Yes. Um, if anyone can talk uh, to this uh, uh, issue, it's you. Um, if you, for example, over promise, uh, under promise and over deliver, you've just lied to me twice. Mm -hmm. And tell me the truth. Set my expectations and don't surprise me, because if you surprise me, my brain goes off into little panic. Help me understand a clear path between where I am and where I want to get to and clear milestones so that when I get there, then it's confirmed that I made the right choice. Having you as my partner, my ally along the way. Why would I spend so much of my time trying to make you my enemy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I mean, a lot of it goes back to leadership again. The, the transparency piece is so valuable. But, you know, my last role when I got to um, I took my CRO job at Power Reviews, the, the prevailing philosophy around losing a deal was you suck and you must have gotten outsold. And as a result, I get there. I'm working with my team. One of my reps, her name was Jen. She lost a deal. I later, and we talked about it, I went into the CRM and I saw that instead of the deal being moved to close lost, the close date was moved out 18 months. <laughs> um, what, what, like that deal, we we lost it. I, I'm still seeing it as qualified state, but it's pushed way out. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. They, um, they, they're going to do something for a little bit, but that's still an active opportunity. It, it, and I'm like, Jen, it's a lost deal, right? And she's like, no, no, no. I'm like, let, let's talk about this. Like, what's going on? Well, as it turns out, when in the CRM, if you move the deal to close lost, the entire executive leadership team would get a notification. And as a result, the CEO would then walk out and be like, what happened? You must have got outsold. You suck. And as a result, every loss was either buried or the rep would come up with a reason why it was the customer's fault. And as a result, we lost slowly. We lost for the same reasons over and over again and didn't know it. And so me being me, um, my CEO and I did not get along at the beginning because my philosophy was 180 degrees from his. The next deal we lost, this guy Dave is working on a big opportunity for a while. He lost it. I told him to come into the office on Friday morning. And I was like, I swear, like, don't be worried. You're going to love it. And he's like, all right. He comes in. We bought champagne. Like we had a champagne toast. Uh, we we celebrated his loss in the conference room, like the whole sales organization. Like Dave walks in, like, hey, right? What I was trying to do is take us from losing is like like a you know we're going to put you on a table and stone you to we're going to celebrate you for not only your effort, you're already getting punished in your quota attainment. You don't get that time back, so let's celebrate the effort. But most importantly, let's celebrate the lessons learned. Absolutely. And we'll celebrate even louder if you're willing to share what you wish you would have saw, what turns you made that you wish you hadn't have made. Like own the, the mistakes and the bigger the mistakes, the bigger the celebration. And that allowed us as an organization to not only embrace losing, we'd lose faster. We didn't lose for the same reasons over and over again. And then that whole process informed marketing so that they could start to brand where we're good and where we're not. And our entire organization became more efficient. Again, we became Chicago's fastest growing tech company from 2014 to 2017. And I swear it was that, and it was that ability to be transparent. And it was differentiating in the way that we sold, but we used our time like a miser hoards gold. And if you listen to uh, Johnny Young's uh, recording from last week, that's up. If you listen to the Simon Byrne recording, that's just went up today. If you listen to the um, Charlie Green recording, every single one of them focuses 
on creating the conditions where the buyer feels safe. To do that, the seller has to feel safe. Yes. We as leaders need to create psychological safety where our people can maximize their risk mm -hmm. and minimize their sacrifice. They, they've got to stop wasting time on trying to fight uh, the next war using the last war's tactics. Yes. Old generals yeah. preparing to fight the last war is exceptionally costly. And you only have to look at that one ripple effect just in marketing. Well, what if instead of focusing on the big data, we focused on the small data, the moments of customer conversation, the throwaway comments, the unusual uses? I'm really curious how history tells us to take that information from customers and develop new categories, new markets, new products. Yeah, I mean, you know, my, you've heard me say this before, my favorite quote of all time, my favorite sales quote of all time, uh, Arthur Dunn in his 1921 book, Scientific Selling and Advertising, you're scrolling along and then there's a page that's completely blank except for one sentence. And that one sentence is, if the truth won't sell it, don't sell it. Right? I just, I love that quote. Like if the truth yeah. won't sell it, don't sell it. And you look throughout history, that idea of we've got to be honest with our customers. And that requires us to be introspective and understand what we're good and where we're not, and then start to investigate ways to expand beyond that. Now, um, in my organizations, and it was something I did at Power Reviews, at Right Hemisphere, did with my teams at Exact Target. This is just kind of a random idea based on what you had just asked. I, I thought I would share it because maybe it's valuable for everybody. Um, we so right hemisphere back in uh, 2008, we were a struggling organization. I got promoted because they decided to fire the VP of sales who was really expensive. And I think they were like, Todd's cheap and he seems to know what he's doing. Let's throw him in there. <laughs> and so I got this promotion. Um, one of the things that I always felt was, why is it when my reps wake up in the morning, they call on 10 different industries and five different buyer personas every day. If that's the case, and if that's what you feel like you're doing, then you can only truly be an expert in what you're selling. You can't be an expert in the buyer's world. You can't make them smarter about their business. And so my idea was we had some success in aerospace and defense. And I thought we, we could sell to any discrete manufacturer, but we had just sold a couple of deals in aerospace and defense. Let's do this. We, I, I call it uh, engaging in extreme firmographic sprints. <laughs> and here's what that sounds like. We hired a consultant who knew the aerospace and defense industry just to come in and spend some time with the reps. So we do a lunch and learn with them. He shared about what's top of mind for aerospace and defense, uh, what the, the different roles and responsibilities are, how they're measured, where they go to get smarter about their roles and their business what their inbox looks like. We learned all of that, right? And then we took marketing and did case studies for our aerospace and defense companies. The next thing you knew, and then we brought in the customers too to talk to us. We didn't have to shrink anybody's territories. My reps woke up every morning prioritizing their aerospace and defense customers because they were confidence and confidence begets confidence. The next thing you know, we were only doing 3 million in revenue. We got a $7 million deal done with Boeing. And then we got Northrop Grumman, and then we got Gulfstream, and then we got Cessna. The next thing you know, we're growing 400% year over year, two years in a row, and selling the business to SAP. The extreme firmographic sprint, what it is, is pick a lane that you know you're good and put all your attention on learning everything you can about that lane for a short period of time. Your confidence will breed confidence in those buyers. You'll start to see momentum in that and then expand out slowly. And that's what we did. We went from aerospace and defense to like for my Southern guys, we did oil and gas. For my Midwest guys, we did um, heavy machinery and automotive. And again, the next thing you know, we're growing like crazy because my team became experts in those spaces. I, I just strongly encourage all of you to think about that. Where are you good? Take that momentum and turn it into a sprint and your confidence will ooze all over the customers. And again, your pipeline will go through the roof. And this is what we call market intimacy. Mm -hmm. It's really understanding 
the context in which your customer operates. Yes. The competitive landscape, the trends, the strategic threats, um, swatting them and their comp set, their competitive set, um, looking for the strengths in their weakness and the weakness in their strength, looking at adjacent providers, alternatives, and really trying to understand the world in which they operate. Because if you don't understand that, your questions cannot possibly be timely, relevant, and valuable. You can't possibly help them understand the reality of their situation and be clear about what is possible and what is not. You can't help them make good decisions. Well, and that, that quote from Arthur Sheldon, true salesmanship is the science of service. Grasp that thought firmly and never let go. How do you provide a service by going, this is why we're awesome and this is why they suck. That's not pre presenting a service, right? Pre uh, providing a service is making them smarter about their business, not yours. And this is why models like Bant, they're fantastic internally. They'd serve no purpose in the sale. They are hot. They are literally poison to the system. There is no way asking someone how they can spend their money on my product can advance their understanding. There is no way asking if they are the decision maker will help them understand what is possible and within their reach. There is no way asking, uh, uh, trying to um, cut them open, pour salt in the wound and then rub sand in it and make it more painful is possibly going to have them see me as their ally. Squeezing them into my time frame is just going to create contempt and disgust in the insular succumbens in their brain. D check out some neuroscience. Everything that you do should not create a reaction that causes their brain to see you as a threat. Mm -hmm. Everything you do should cause them to see you as one of us instead of one of them. Yeah. That's why in 1905, salespeople were considered to be a valuable asset because every time they turned up, they provided useful insight. Yeah, it's funny. The um, Everybody freaked out a couple of years ago when Gallup came out with that new study that said that 72% of buyers prefer a rep-free experience. Oh, oh. I, I I thought that was the dumbest study I've ever read. And here's why. Um, like, who are these 28% that prefer a rep full experience? I, I'd like to meet them. It's this idea that like when you go to the airport and you have to talk to somebody, it right. means you're having a bad day, right? It means something has gone off the rails. Something sucks. Like I want a hundred percent agent free experience at the airport because I don't need it. I want a hundred percent rep free experience when I'm buying something when I don't feel like I need it. One, do I don't feel like I need it? Where I've got all the answers and I don't need that assistance. Salespeople providing a service. Again, it keeps going back to this service orientation that when salespeople are making me smarter about my business, they're doing the homework for me. They're presenting the pros and the cons. I want 100% of my buying experiences to include that type of interaction. That 72% is because salespeople don't think that way. They're doing the bants. They're going, hey, I'm caring about my outcomes and you are a means for me to get there versus my role is to help you achieve outcomes that maybe you thought never possible. And I'm here to be your guide, your Sherpa. That 72% number is a stupid number. It's just a rant, like they could have come up with anything. I think it's more um, indicative of something else, which is it just says that salespeople didn't do their job right. Right. Because they were so fixated on the short term pipeline and trying to sell someone on a meeting, a demo, a proposal, uh, instead of thinking, OK, who in my uh, territory is probably going to have the kind of issues that I am really well suited to help mm -hmm. over the next six to 36 months? What can I do to institute a systematic approach in order to build relationships with those people and on every single touch be timely, relevant and valuable, mm -hmm. advance their understanding of what's real, what's not, what's possible, what isn't, and help them move towards making a good decision well? Exactly. exactly. And if I can do that over 6, 12, 18, 24, 36 months, and I have 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 touches with half a dozen to a dozen people, Odds are when they move from passive looking 
attention, interest, to active looking, desire and decision making, I am in pole position because I know all the moving parts. I know all the people. I have relationships. I've never once tried to sell them, pressure them. I've always put my selfish self-interest on the back burner because I know that they are not ready and I am intending always to be their ally. As opposed to, hi, Todd, have you got some money you can give me? Exactly. I mean, that's it. It's again, 72% of buyers prefer a rep free experience. I think if they asked the question right, the answer would come out to 100% of buyers for, uh, prefer a rep free experience when the rep sucks. And 90% of buyers prefer a rep full experience when the rep is truly an ally and providing value and making me smarter and helping me achieve outcomes I never thought possible. Like that, That's if the tough. study was done for, uh, correctly. I, I mean, how is this difficult for anyone to consider? <laughs> the, 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 the thing is, when you are a buyer, we've all been buyers and the experience is rarely one that we, I, I can remember one experience, Slater's menswear, back in 1998, uh, I think it was, because <laughs> Suzanne and I had been married for a while. Um, and I went in there, this guy sized me up and I was a very odd shape. Um, and he got my size perfect with all three suits. And they were slightly different sizes, but he knew them. And I bought two suits off him there and then. Mm -hmm. I tried to hire him because I was in recruitment. I was so impressed. Now, I can honestly say I haven't had that kind of buying experience since 1998, which is slightly depressing as that's 26 years hence. Slightly. <laughs> that's really depressing. <laughs> yeah. And I've spent a lot of money. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. It's funny. The, um, you know, they, you've heard me say this uh, quote before, but it, it's the, the idea that buyers know more nowadays Right. You hear those four words, buyers know more nowadays. I mean, that's actually a quote from Thomas Herbert Russell's 1912 book, Salesmanship. Right. And it was like, it's a quote. I've got to show you this because um, but this is the Sears Roebuck catalog from 1908. You know, at the time, the sales community was worried that because of the proliferation of catalogs like this, this is basically Amazon in paper form. Like yeah. You could buy everything from uh, modular homes to, I mean, this is the department of human hair. Like I want to buy some human <laughs> hair, but the, the point being that back then they were worried about the proliferation of catalog mail order and the proliferation of advertising, putting to bed this idea that we would even need salespeople. And I bet you if Gallup would have asked the same question, 70% of buyers would have preferred a referee experience back then too. What happened? The opposite happened right? The sales profession flourished. We get into the e-commerce world of the 19, or the 2010s, right? 2015, Forrester proclaiming that a million B2B jobs, sales jobs would go away by 2020. And that hundreds of thousands of college graduates wouldn't graduate into the profession because buyers knew more nowadays. The opposite happened. Why? Because more information available to buyers hasn't made it easier on them. It's made it harder. And if we have a choice. service mindset of doing the homework for them, calling that information for them and helping them make great predictions, that's when the sales profession continues to flourish. And those are the salespeople that are doing really well, to your point, that have that mindset of adding value instead of being the, hey, you got anything other than lint in your wallet? I want it. <laughs> I, I steal that one. Um, so, the, but the thing is, the channel has not changed throughout human history. Exactly, the channel remains the same. It's the human mind. It's the brain. Yep. The medium changes, whether it's face to face, whether it's the telephone, whether it's catalog, whether it's direct mail, whether it's the internet. It does that. That might change, but no. at the end of the day, the human mind is the channel. And they were making oh, calls. This is, uh, I got this. This is a, a SC Electric 1921 phone. Um, I had read an article about how there were businesses in 1921 that actually set up uh, cold calling phone booths in their offices. And the phones were these. And so I, I was like, I got to have this. And so I went out and I found this. This thing is a beauty. Still has some wires here. We can uh, make maybe make some cold calls on this thing a little bit later. <laughs>
I, well, I remember seeing photographs and uh, old film footage, sort of sepia tone, uh, with rows and rows of those things. Yeah. Um, well, again, yeah, we see history repeating. And mm -hmm. um, what was it in those really tough times? Who were the sellers who just r rose to the top? Because they were always at the top. The thing was that they didn't change. Well, right. I mean, it's funny. Um, so this is a 1957 book called Successful Low Pressure Salesmanship. Um, <laughs> what I'm, I'm researching right now. Is it by? Is, what's that? Uh, this is, is by it? Edward Berman. Um, but in 1927, I found a number of articles that talked about, uh, they were debating in a magazine about low pressure salesmanship versus high pressure, meaning that you know, as we came out of that forgotten depression of the early 1920s, there was this prevailing philosophy that started to actually gain momentum that low pressure salesmanship is, I think they called it the bunk. I got to find the article. Um, and that buyers need to be basically convinced. They need to be forced because they're too stupid to realize what they need. And the 19, mid 1920s is where you started to see this rise of high pressure salesmanship, which was high, like, you know, banging on the customer and basically convincing them instead of being low pressure, which by, you know, Edward's definition here, the articles in 19, the 1920s, low pressure salesmanship was again, providing a service and having a service mindset. Every time we hit these down, uh, like these poor economies, this high pressure approach comes up and in every case, it has eroded the perception of the sales profession and taken it. So we take one step forward and two steps back, and we keep doing this over and over again. With I this, worry when I look at today's environment that we're starting to see the high pressure pop up again, right? When things were easy, we were guides. When things got harder, we started to get back to this old bad way of thinking. Todd, you and I are of an age. This is now going, well, we are now officially in my eighth recession. Okay, you've done seven. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's right. You're just tra tra trailing a, a little bit. But um, mm -hmm. so this is now my eighth recession. Mm -hmm. In the last seven, my observation is people were afraid. They had a scarcity mindset and there was a lot of uncertainty. Yep. Recession is essentially a collective mental condition where a lot of people become depressed simultaneously. And then they see other people more depressed and it becomes a spiral of violence. Um, how we respond to that defines the outcomes that we generate. We actually have choice. We have agency. We don't have to go with um, the rest. And to emphasize your point, I'm seeing a huge proliferation in methodologies that encourage loving the grind, which I think is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yep. Um, well, uh, not uh, welcoming, but uh, actually powering through objections, um, and uh, you know, loving the fact that you're getting rejected and told to piss off. Um, which again, it I, I get it if you're a bit slow witted, um. <laughs> and you really want to work very hard for less money. Um, and for a few very talented people who've got a real knack, that works. But ultimately, what I see is people um, succeeding towards self-destruction because you can't sustain that without actually looking in the mirror and thinking, I really don't like this. And my pal, Dave Davis, who co-wrote uh, Making Channel Sales Work with me, uh, we had lunch a couple of weeks ago and he said uh, this beautiful quote said um i wouldn't want it done to me and i wouldn't want to be known as someone who did it to other people mm -hmm. and that's what the seller code is really about as well it's it's being the kind of person who does good work and how we're successful matters that that really makes a difference and um you know uh, johnny if are you still on um, I, I'd love your take on this. Uh, no, yeah, I'm here. Oh, you are excellent. Um, so yeah, I mean, why is that important to you? Because and then I'll shut up. So it's important for me simply to survive in the job, 
I spent a lot of time very much questioning myself as a salesperson. Um, wins and losses, wins were chalked up to good fortune and nothing more. Losses were, I suck, I can't do this, reaffirmation of my uh, imposter syndrome. So that how is that shift in mindset from what what we do to how we do it has been incredibly powerful for me because it's not about those X's and O's in the wins and loss column. It's about, am I providing good service? Am I providing a good experience for my customers? Are they people that I could go for a drink with? Are they people that could buy in future companies? And that has led to me enjoying my job. I think me enjoying my job allows me to perform better and so on and so forth. Um, so that shift in mindset is is dramatic, the effect. Oh, Marcus, you went on mute. So in terms of your general well-being, in terms of uh, your the time that you have and the boundaries that you set, um, how's that changed? Uh, so in a big way, um, I enjoy also spending my time sharing my experiences with other people. That is more job satisfaction. But actually more importantly than just the job stuff, more present at home. I have a two-year-old, as you might have seen in the comments that I've managed to get rid of uh, for a moment. Um, <laughs> simply enjoying more time with him. Like I look back and it was like yesterday he was born and I probably spent 12 months with that, mostly disconnected, mostly worrying about is a prospect going to email because I don't know if they will because I don't know if they're actually on this journey with me to, okay, I feel like I've done a good job today. I can switch off and be more present with with the family, which I always thought was quite a cheesy line that people just threw in there as kind of like a cliche, but there's definitely some truth to it. What matters most? That's at, at a human level, what really matters most? So Todd, th uh, Johnny, thank you. Um, so uh, Todd, how do we get to understand what matters most to a customer? Well, Alan asked in the the, uh, the chat here, like, where would you suggest the best places to learn this from if you can't afford to bring in an expert? And I mean, I, I think it answers both questions here is your customers want to see you be successful. I, if you've been a good partner to them, you'd be surprised if you just asked them. The, the expert that we brought in in the aerospace and defense industry was a guy that somebody happened to know. He was, you know, 70 year old guy had been around the block a hundred times, knew everything. We got lucky. But when we went and asked our customers, we're like, Hey, listen, we want to understand more about you so that we can help more customers that like you. And it helps us be more successful, which means your solutions continue to grow. They were more than willing to come do lunch and learns with my team. Now, when they did, there's four questions that we like to ask. All right. So this for everybody, if you bring in a customer, Instead of asking that customer, like, hey, tell us why we're great. Oh, say that part about why we're great again. So far. like, no, like the four that we would always ask. Number one is you know, just tell us a little bit. I guess this isn't a question, but what, what's going on in the industry and in your role right now? So give us a general state of what the headwinds and tailwinds are. The second question that we would ask is tell us about your role and how are you measured? Like, what constitutes success versus failure in your role? How do your leaders look at your success and your failures? The number three thing that we would always ask is when you're trying to get smarter about your business or your role, where do you go? What do you read? What podcast do you listen to? Who do you follow in the socials? And then the fourth question that we'd always ask, and we always teed them up for this, but it was, hey, would you be willing to show us your inbox? Now that was the, the magic maker. The times that we ask customers to show us their inbox and just tell us what is white noise? Like what are the things that get select all deleted? But what are the emails that you get and the outreaches that you get that you actually pay attention to, that you spend your time with? That was such an eye opener for my teams when our customers would do that. But even more importantly, an exact target, we were selling to marketers. You know who was right down the hallway? Oh, our CMO. And then there's a whole set of cubes of digital marketers in our marketing team. Every other week for our sales meetings, we would have them come in, one of them. And we would ask them the same four questions, right? What's top of mind? How are you measured? 
where do you go to get smarter about your role in your business and show us your inbox? And we had so much empathy for our customers when we were selling to marketers, we couldn't help but make them smarter about their roles and their business. And it would lead to our solutions instead of leading with it. That's how you do it, Alan and everybody else. It's easy, the resources are right there. Your customers or even individuals in your own organization have gold mines of information to give you that empathy so that you can make a stronger connection with your customers. And you can go into, if you have a customer success team or a customer yes. team, they speak to customers six to eight hours a day. Your reps are speaking to them for maybe three minutes. The, the sales calls aren't going to be where the real gold is. It's in the customer complaints. It's in the customer stories where they're reporting back that they got the outcome that they intended and how you've changed their lives. It's in the unusual uses of that your product. Yes. Workarounds. Yes. Um, the things that they say, the, the remarkable things that they say and remark on that make your product remarkable, that would be remarkable to other people just like them. Yes. Yes. Then, AI. I mean, AI for 25 bucks a month, you have the sum total of human knowledge that is on the internet available to you if you point it in the right direction with some half decent questions. If you ask it crap questions, it will bring shit back. Simple yeah. as. Exactly. So can I share two questions? So the client success thing just triggered me. So as a CRO, I had client success under my tutelage. We asked uh, our customers two questions and these try it. I'm telling you, you'll love this. Um, but when they would renew, we asked them two questions. Number one is, hey, I think I know why you renewed. I, you, we're awesome, right? But in all seriousness, with all of the other priorities and all the other options out there, why did you renew with us? and just shut up, right? That'll give you some serious insights. And it, maybe it won't. Maybe they'll be like, ah, because it was easy, right? You're doing what you said, all right, cool. But then question number two is to your point, Marcus, what's one unexpected outcome that you've gotten from working with us that when you started working with us, you weren't expecting, right? And I call that the tennis ball analogy. I don't know if you did this like in middle school, where you're in class and your teacher comes in with tennis balls and puts them on the table and is like, come up with as many uses for the tennis ball as possible. And we'd be like, all right, coin purse, a stress ball, hang it from the garage to make sure you don't pull the car in too far, put it on the bottom of your walker, right? Like all that stuff, none of which would be playing tennis. And that same exact environment can happen when you're talking to your customers about those unexpected outcomes that's going to give you insights into like, I remember there was an accounting firm that I was working with where they, it wasn't, they were selling financial consolidation technology and they asked the customer, Hey, what's one unexpected outcome that you received from working with us uh, over the last couple of years? The guy's answer was you gave me my family back on the weekends. Mm. Like, what do you mean? Like, Hey, when we were trying to close our books, I was in the office from Friday morning until Wednesday night, trying to close the books as quickly as possible. You gave me my weekend back. I got young kids that like they're playing soccer and I'm missing all their games, right? Like you gave me my family back. And it was like, holy crap, right? Like if we didn't ask that question, we wouldn't make that connection that we're not just selling technology to help you close books faster. We're, we're selling family cohesion, right? And relationships like that's, that provides you such an opportunity to grow your business that way too, and then develop your passion as well. So uh, a recommendation for everybody is Martin Lindstrom's book, Small Data, and also read Biology, B-U-Y-ology. Um, both of those are fantastic primers uh, to help you really understand how much value there is in speaking to and listening to your customers. Which then brings me to the four foundational uh, pillars of selling. Deep listening, actually being fully present and being comfortable with the silence and being humble enough to learn stuff. Because real listening is the transfer of emotion and intent, meaning. It's not just the words. It's everything that is packaging the words. Then 
really powerful, insightful, provocative questions that help the buyer advance their understanding. That they're not to help you gather BANT data or medic data. Um, they are there to help the buyer advance and to help you co-develop an understanding of the causes of their issues, what is possible and within their reach, and move towards making a good decision well. Simple as that. Now, on top of that, we need deep empathy, real empathy. Empathy is not understanding. That's a part of it. Empathy is feeling what they feel, hearing what they hear and interpret, seeing as they see it to their satisfaction. And then the icing on the cake is applied um, business acumen understanding the context in which people operate. Everybody seems to fixate on techniques and tactics and trying to manipulate and coerce. Don't. Focus on those four things and focus on this one thing, which is feeding their brain with dopamine. Nothing else. That is that is pretty much ethical selling, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to we don't buy when we're convinced. We buy when we can predict. So absolutely, predict. and if you can't sell it with the truth, don't sell it. Don't sell it. Exactly. That's that exactly is it. Just genius. <laughs> Who was that by? Um, by the way, yeah, that was uh, Arthur Dunn in his 1921 book, Scientific Selling and Advertising. And the uh, quote yes. was, "If the truth won't sell it, don't sell it." And it was the only sentence on the page too. It's a beautiful thing. I took a picture of it. I use it in my keynotes all the time. I love it. Just brilliant. So Todd, wrapping all of this up then, um, in a tough market, under pressure, sellers going to feel an enormous amount of pressure from above. Mm -hmm. um, they will probably be giving themselves a hard time because the tendency is to recruit people who have a very strong work ethic. Um, so they're going to be working towards burnout. What can we do in order to equip people um, and help them realize that they don't have to do that. They And they can actually give voice to their values and they can push back and speak truth to power. Yeah, well, I think, uh, first of all, um, and I think Johnny, you mentioned something about this too, but uh, this is um, a book called Salesmanship Applied. It's from Paul Ivey. Um, the year is 1930. Oh, wait, 1925. So this one's 1925. I wish you could smell it because it smells like history. Um, it smells like grandma's basement, actually. But um, there, there's a quote in here that says, worry kills more people than work. Right? Like worry keeps kills more people than work. And this idea that when, when we're worried and we're worrying all the time, that's going to kill you more than, you know, putting in the effort, doing things the right way. Um, I think it just comes down to this idea that there's no question that transparency sells better than perfection. And there is no question that due to the proliferation of information available to buyers, we have to do it anyway, right? We don't buy when we're convinced, we buy when we can predict. Our role is to provide a service to our customers. And as Arthur Sheldon said, that is what true salesmanship is. Grasp that thought firmly and never let go. Gosh, you got to play the long game. I mean, if you've got leaders that aren't thinking the right way, I've got a uh, I've got a purple book here that uh, that maybe help them like maybe just slide it on their desk and have them read it. Called the Transparent Sales Leader that'll take people through it. Uh, just a, a more structured way to think about revenue leadership, where you can maximize your revenue capacity. It's all on a bed of transparency, and it thinks through all of these things from your forecast to the way that you build the culture in your organization and the science of intrinsic inspiration. Well, you just confirmed something in my mind, which is when we can predict, we convince ourselves. Our job is not to convince the buyer. Our job is to create the conditions so the buyer can convince themselves if it is the right thing for them to do. Exactly, yep. To begin with, we need to understand the belief that underpins why we do what we do in service of their outcome. Mm -hmm. Then we need to understand what are the outcomes that they want 
when they invest in our product or service, because they are not buying our product or service, they are renting the outcomes. And what can we do? What do we have agency? What do we have control over? What, uh, where do we have a voice that will be heard that can influence that? The reality is only about 30% of the things that you have believe you have control over do you have any control over, and only about 30% of what you believe you can control in those do you actually have control. The key is to understand what you cannot control and stop wasting your time on that. Most of those are outcomes. And if you look at what most people measure, they measure outcomes, not inputs. You have control over the inputs. You can choose what behavior to do, what to say, how to think. You can plan. What you can't do is um, ensure that the customer will give you a payment on a specific day. What you can do is create the conditions so that they can predict and convince themselves, so that they make the decision. Fair? That's it. Okay, so final thoughts as we wrap up. Man, we've gone through a lot here, haven't we? Mm. Uh, this has been fantastic, but I think it's, it just goes back to that idea. True salesmanship is the science of service. Grasp that thought firmly and never let go, right? That this idea that buyers know more nowadays has continued to prove false because more information available to buyers hasn't made it easier, it's made it harder. And if we embrace that idea of doing the homework for the buyer and be their advocate, be their Sherpa, win fast, lose fast through transparency, I think you can't help but succeed and continue to thrive. And there's always going to be place for salespeople that think that way. I think to build on what you just said, part of the problem is that the fixation with trying to make the sale, instead of having consequential critical thinking applied mm -hmm. uh, as to whether we should make the sale or not, yeah. is going to be really key. Um, because if we don't pay attention to that, then what we do is we create a downstream problem and we create a churn problem, which then CS has to deal with. All of those tickets that they then would never have created disappear if you don't create that problem in the first place. Right. So think about the impact of your decisions and think two, three, four steps down the road. If you think about the value chain, who else is going to be affected? If I do a good job or a bad job, if we deliver on time to uh, expectation or we miss some standard or deadline, what's the knock on effect through the organization? Well, if every department were working together with the customer's outcome at the heart and everyone was focused on getting that job done instead of trying to make the valuation target, I suspect we'd see quite a few companies thriving through this recession. Yeah. I mean, like you said, if the financial services firms are are prioritizing profitability over revenue at all costs, then that should be in line with the way that you're thinking about your revenue leadership approach, too. And there's still a mismatch. But there's always that should always have been the case. The problem yeah. is in the last 56 years, because when Milton Friedman in 67 said everyone exists, to share, all companies exist to serve shareholder value, that was a big lie. That gave rise to private equity, who then peddled the Ponzi scheme. And what you've done is you've created lots of financial instruments where people's job to be done is make a valuation target so you can flip it and some other poor sucker has to pay the bill. That's <laughs> I win, you lose thinking. Oh. I think that's very outdated and it's yeah. brought us to the knees, to our knees. Yeah. Todd, thank you. you so much. Um, as ever, fantastic. Um, any final questions from the audience as we wrap up? So I have a question, if that's okay. Yes, please. Sure. So I was having a conversation with a colleague today, and we were talking about sales methodology. She's relatively new to the business, so I'm helping her to, to hopefully get up to speed as quickly as possible. And she was reviewing a discovery call of mine, and she was like, well, why didn't you ask when the signature date needs to be. Why didn't you ask about budget, et cetera? And my, I just explained my thought process and, and I just had that feeling at the time that none of those questions served 
the buyer. They were just about what's going to serve our leadership team. And she was like, well, does that not make you feel a bit uncomfortable? Because, you know, where's the certainty in the opportunity? So that got me thinking about how leadership are likely approaching this, which is we need these milestones because that gives us certainty that this opportunity is real, even if that's total BS. Mm -hmm. But we can talk about it like it's real. So the common theme, though, for me was certainty, right? And people like to have certainty and not uh be in the gray so is the job to do to deliver more through this you know philosophy of selling to find a different certainty to fixate on could be the quality of work that we do how we do it but redefining what gives us certainty so that we can let the results end up speaking for themselves i'm just curious your perspective on that having been uh in that cro role yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. Um, you know, first of all, I've always been a, such an advocate for, it, first of all, trust. If you've got trust with a customer, that's an opportunity to differentiate in the way that you sell. And that trust becomes more powerful than two or three of the features that maybe you don't have. Right. And so you've got to build trust. And that's why I believe in that transparency approach and that leading with what you give up to be great at your core. Like, hey, if this is gonna be important to you, can we talk about that now versus three months from now, right? And that transparency will no doubt beget transparency so that you can have deeper, richer conversations with your customers. Now, that's the first part, right? Like when you're trying to create differentiation, that transparency is an incredible differentiator. That's where it starts. But then number two is, Again, leadership, I've always been such an advocate for buyer centrism in the way that we look at the opportunities we need to focus on. So instead of checking the boxes on Bant, what I was trying to check the boxes with with my leaders to their reps is, hey, what is the customer expressing through their words and their actions that tell us that they understand or they recognize that their status quo is on shaky ground? or their status quo is no longer sustainable, or their status, like they need to start thinking about doing something different tomorrow than they're doing today. And let's talk about that. That was really truly the only qualification that we needed. And so I had created a qualification um, acronym and it's called, is the customer tempted? And so the, the, the tempt was, uh, you know, first of all, transparency, right? We'd start with, so it, uh, are we like that, that uh, transparency was first, meaning will the truth sell it, right? And then the E was engagement, meaning the customer proves to us that they're actually engaged with us when th we're on their calendar, right? For another appointment. Like that's engagement is shown through their willingness to talk to us again. The M to me was finding a mobilizer Right, mobilizer, uh, that's a challenger customer term, meaning uh, through the words and actions of the customer we're talking to, are they able to mobilize change in their organization? That's not a title, that's not a level, that's an individual and the things that they say and the things that they do. The second, or that that last T is, um, is uh, what, what is it? Um, crap, why am I losing that? Oh, it's trigger, meaning that the trigger is, is there something in their world that tells us that the status quo is no longer sustainable, right? To the point I was making earlier. And then the, the tempt, oh, that there was the P was a uh, plan. Meaning, do we have some understanding of what the path and the journey is going to look like? Are we aligned around that? There was no E or D, so it was just tempt. So transparency, engagement, mobilizer, is there a plan, meaning, Part of transparency is illuminating the journey together and make sure that we're willing to take it together. And then trigger is that idea that their status quo is no longer sustainable. If you want to add the E and the D there, Marcus. <laughs> but th that was the way that we thought about it. And again, it was a it was like a pure buyer centric way of is the customer expressing these things through their words and actions and will the truth sell it?
Fantastic. Oh, you might. Oh, there you go. Marcus, you're on mute, buddy. There you go. Let's start with Daryl Stickles' equation. So uncertainty times vulnerability equals perceived risk. Mm -hmm. This is about eliminating perceived risk associated with you, your offer, your company, your partners, the decision that they will make if they decide to go with you, the risk they bear in terms of it backfiring. So um, I interviewed Jack Shamas a couple of weeks back. Uh, Jack was uh, COO for Transworld Airlines. He was the chief financial officer for Standard & Poor's and Charles Schwab. Um, he's a Parisian Jewish CFO of 45 years who doesn't take any crap. And I asked him what matters most when he meets a salesperson. He was very clear. I want a salesperson who will help me make the right decision and not make the wrong decision. And if it goes wrong, he'll fix it or she'll fix it. Mm -hmm. That's what they want. Yep. Because buyers want to make good decisions well. Our job as sellers is to facilitate making good decisions. So we have to remove any perceived risk associated with us. If we do, you remove 50% of the complexity in that relationship immediately. Now, that then brings us to the main trust equation, which was developed in the trusted advisor uh, and uh, Charlie Green developed it further in trust-based selling, which is the best book on sales ever written. Sorry, Todd. Um, and um, credibility plus reliability, those are table stakes. That's the stuff everybody should be able to do. Credibility means you can do what you say you can and reliability means you do it. I mean, that's the base, that's the minimum expectation from any supplier. Mm -hmm. Now, plus intimacy, which I'll come back to in a minute, over self-orientation. Yes, everybody must understand you are there to make a living and you have to make sales. But if you are, I win, you win, and I win comes first, it means your self-orientation is high, which means trust cannot be high. Because the key operator in that equation is intimacy. Do they let you in? Do they invite you over the threshold and into the hearth and see you as one of us instead of one of them? Well, the key to that is the removal of perceived risk associated with you. That's our job. Just get rid of, get yourself out of the way. Don't try and convince. Stop trying to sell. Selling should be the most noble act we perform in business, bar none, because all it is, is the facilitation of making the best decision for them, for now and the future, whether it involves us or not. A good one to end on. That's awesome. Excellent. Todd Capone, thank you. and Thank, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. You're always brilliant. Um, and thank you all for attending. Johnny, thank you for your contribution. Thank you all for the questions. If you've been moved by this and you're inspired by this, please go to thesellercode, all one word, dot org. Look at the seller code. If it resonates with you, maybe add it to your email signature. If you're feeling really brave, at the bottom of your email signature, say something along the lines of, I believe that buyers deserve a fair deal. This is how I like to operate. And then a link. Now, what I've started to do, and again, um, I will share this with you as a final parting gift, is this email. We've started sending this. Johnny, you can tell us um, because you're the first one to test this. OK, just before you send it, uh, before you meet them, you send this. I'm looking forward to our chat. Big believer in doing business in a way that puts our conversation and your needs first. That's why I follow a set of principles laid out in the seller code. It's all about being transparent, fair, and genuinely helpful. Take a peek at the code, and if you get a chance, and it's not about legalities or small print, just how I like to do things. And of course, your perspective matters to me. I'm all ears if there's anything that you think could be uh, I could be doing better. Looking forward to meeting Thursday at 3.30 on Zoom. <coughs> now, if you were the buyer and you received that and you clicked on the link, and you saw that in all of my dealings, 
I will prioritize your interest. I will act with integrity. You're going to hold me to account because when I put it in writing, it changes me. Dare you. I dare you. Go on. You know you want to. <laughs> so on that happy note, thank you all. Goodbye.